thanks guys for, for turning up tonight and um, yeah, hopefully my voice carries enough. You can hear it? Yeah, good, good that I have to use a microphone. So what I'd like to do is, is take you a little bit through the biology of Southern Toadlets, but probably from an aspect where you won't get from reading a book. So I've tried to differentiate that just a little bit. Then I'd like to talk a little bit about the current threatening processes for Southern Toadlets and, and what the conservation of the species looks like at the moment. And um, we'll see how time goes. So I've only got 150 slides, so I set my timer for three hours. So we, we all good? He says take another sip of beer. Okay. Um, so if we're gonna go plowing out after Southern Toadlets, I'd like to mock up a little bit of a field trip here and do a little virtual Southern Toadlet immersion if we can and, and talk a little bit about the biology from there but if if we are going to do that we're going to do that in <coughs> april because this species is really highly seasonal now you get a textbook and, you, and you're going to get something like that presented to you and, and this was a piece of work from david woodruff four decades ago five, a while ago and um look dates are great and i wouldn't argue with those dates plus or minus a few days either way, they're really good. But the reality is, and this is a slice through the calling activity of a southern total population, and yet, sure, they're calling in March, and they're calling in May, but April, and you probably can't see this back here, but we're talking the start of April, being right about there. So we get some calling in March, absolutely. But just look at the relative amounts of calling. This is a species that is really heavily focused in its calling activity in that period of time. And to show you probably a slightly different perspective of this, this is the probability of detection of southern toadlets. If you stood out there for one minute, which is the blue line, or if you stood out there for five minutes, which is the red line. So if you're going looking for this species in March, there's a fair chance you could be standing on top of the toadlets but still not getting a detection for them. But if you're going out in April, whether you're there for a minute, five minutes, whether it's raining, whether it hasn't rained, there's still a very high probability you're going to get these toadlets and pick them up. Um, and the same for May, they will call pretty well through May up until that first Arctic blast we get. And as soon as you get that Arctic blast, that's about time they call it quits. So this year, we had that little dump on the 5th of March, you might remember. Toadlets in, this is Mitcham Weather Station, the toadlets in Donvale were going nuts for a couple of days. And then it tails off again, and then the calling picks back up again in April. So we're definitely going to do our field work out in April. And time. The people will tell me that toadlets call during the day, and I've heard them call during the day. I'm sure lots of people have heard them call during the day. But relative to what? So this is sunset. This is on a day with no rain in the previous 24 hours. And this is a day with rain in the previous 24 hours. And yet there is definitely some calling. But look how relative that is to the nocturnal calling from 6 p.m. to midnight. It, it kind of dwarfs it. So, yep, absolutely, you can do field work and look for toilets during the day, but that's not where you would focus your time and energy on. And it really is after the sun is set. So, we're going to find a nice piece of Yarra Valley somewhere, a nice floodplain, something like that. If it is the Yarra Valley, we'd have to have a time machine now, which is a bit unfortunate. But um, anyway, we'll find a nice floodplain like this, and we'll go wandering through it. And you know, we'll pick a day where it's rained early April and we've got lots of Lamandra and Poa there. And, and the topography of the floodplain is just dimpled with the remnants where all big trees have fallen over and they've left their divots out there. And you've got that smattered through and that's really what we're looking for for a breeding site out here. And so we'll sit down out there and we'll immerse ourselves. I'm kind of lucky the football club hasn't come in yet. Oh. We'll see if we can get a bit of a That's not a southern toilet. But every night, every night just as the sun goes down, always a brown tree frog. Oh, 
hope you can hear them at the back, can you? Yeah. Nice backdrop, I would have thought. So we're sitting there, the sun's just set. Uh, bit of mist because it's been raining and the cool night air and so we're starting to get a little bit of mist forming in it. And these guys will start calling from these depressions. Usually not at the base of the depressions, they're usually up the sides. So what we're looking for is a little male that's excavated into the side of that burrow. He'll come up to that entrance, he'll start calling from the entrance there, which is, you know, if you're ever triangulating this species, then a torch you can imagine is problematic. If you start shining a light on these guys, they tend to duck down. Um, laser pointers are the best thing to use in the field with these guys. Triangulate them very easy with a laser pointer, and they keep calling through. Of course, if it's wet, they don't care whether you're out there with a camera or a spotlight or x-ray machine or whatever, they'll just call ad nauseum, and they'll just continue regardless of whether you're there or not. Now, there is a slight variation in their call you, as you will hear, and they don't have this place to themselves. If it's working. Technical difficulties, come on. Ah, yeah, it's working. So, they do share this environment with Geovic, Geoquinia victoriana, something smooth from it. Um, they have an interesting partitioning of the environment, both um, temporally and spatially. So we're on the floodplain here, it's pretty dry. If you walk to the creek, the Geovics will be going nuts. Come back to your southern toadlet site, we're early April, there'll be the odd Geovic calling. They're around there, but they're not calling yet. You come back early May, toadlets won't be calling much, but your Geocrinia will. So they have a little bit of a partitioning of the environment. But you'll notice in this chorus there's a fairly odd noise. You hear the one that's making the... Yeah. Um, that's a breeding male. And if he's played his cards right, then a female will have approached the male in the burrow. And his call changes. And he starts going into this mating call. And it's, it's a really elaborate thing. And I'd love to know what's going on because it goes on for hours. So I'm sure there's a whole courtship ritual associated with this frog. We've been out heard this sort of call and then there'll be some clucking and then some purring and all sorts of things going on down here. We'll go off for an hour or two, come back and he's still doing all that. And then you go, oh, I'm just going to have a little bit of a peek, but yeah, sure enough, there's a female with him and hours and hours of this calling. I'm not even sure that he's the only one making these calls. You know, there, there could be some vocalisation by the females in there as well. The females, by the way, are um, unfortunately dispositioned at the start of the season. They're like golf balls with little legs. Um, this isn't a defensive posture. This is just full of absolute eggs. Uh, we have noted that um, females coming into sites and then leaving sites still grab it, but having dropped a fair bit of weight, will come back into sites again. Um, so we postulate that she's, go for it. Um, she's dropping her eggs at a number of males over the season there and not depositing all her eggs just with a single male and I, I might um, remove our background. I like it. Yeah, it's kind of pleasant and appropriate. <laughs> Maybe we'll just leave the one going, huh? Yeah, I yeah. yeah. Um, So, all going well. He will have a nest and he may have several females visit and that nest may contain two, three hundred, four hundred eggs from a variety of females. There's no evidence that I've read that he takes any particular care of those eggs, but if you go and disturb the male, he will leave the nest and he won't return back to it again. Um, the eggs are susceptible to fungal infections, insect attack, desiccation, and at the moment some of the, the sites, they're actually jellies dissolving, the tadpoles are just lying on the ground because there's just not enough water to flood these depressions. So the fate of those eggs is rather uh, pencils. They will remain viable. I mean, Murray's students had these in a lab 
for nearly a year and viable. So provided no adverse effects happen to them, they can have quite a longevity. Of course, in nature, as soon as it starts getting warm October, they will desiccate. So they don't quite have that luxury. Um, we did do a couple of studies looking at how faithful males were to their site. So we got curious because of one particular male we always found in the one particular spot. So we had a little bit of study. I'm just, this is the site, by the way, which just, believe it or not, that's a depression. Um, not a particularly elaborate one, but that's all we're looking for here. And um, you can see by the vegetation on the base, it's probably not holding water for significant periods of time. Once it would have, now it doesn't. Um, and this is just one depression in a whole heap of depressions on the floodplain. And so we went and looked at the males each year, and they're recognisable, and I'll show you why they're recognisable, and just looked how faithful they were to that depression. You know, were they coming back each year to that depression? Were they ever leaving? Which is probably more to the point. And despite one boy taking off there and another one that was never particularly settled, that was a female, um, the boys were coming back. And they were coming back to that power or that Lamandra in that depression year after year. One boy we studied um, called Lonely George, he had a huge depression which flooded, but he was the only male that ever called them, and he never, ever had eggs. So no one visited Lonely George, and these guys have a fingerprint. This is a fingerprint. Just check out, usually just pick a marking, but if you look at that marking up there, we'll just follow it each year. It's still there, it's still the same frog. It's still there, still the same frog. It's still there, still the same frog. It's still there, still the same frog. It's still the same frog. Still the same frog. Um, about 14 years, 15 years, we, we suspect that these guys will go for. 2008, I think was the last, oh, 2009, that no wrong, was the last time we, we saw Rob Lonely George. But he was going back to that same clump of grass. Now, this depression was this room, and it would flood, so George had to rack off. But he was finding his way back to that tuft of power each year, as he's calling the site. So these guys have some amazing skills and are incredibly faithful to sites that I suspect are faithful to them, that are no longer of breeding use for them. Um, what they're hoping, of course, is this to happen. Um, you can see the calling sites are way up here. It doesn't make sense for a frog that has this breeding strategy to nest on the base of the depressions. Get a little bit of rain, your eggs will hatch, and their cactus the next day. So you want to have them up high. Um, that way, you know, it takes a significant amount of rain either to flood the site or to wash them down. What we're finding at the moment is the ones this year, the ones that are down lower, the soil's really quite moist still, and the jelly capsule's breaking down and the tadpoles are just lying on the dirt. While the ones that are up higher up here are just desiccating, and literally as we speak at the moment, that's what's occurring. We've had some nice warm temperatures and that's just exacerbating that problem. They should be flooded by now. Um, if they do manage to hatch, this is one day old, all tails. Um, within 10 days, they look like a normal tadpole. The GT stripe, really nice way of recognising these guys in the field. Um, the cohort that's with them don't, don't have that GT stripe, so your um, crinias and your geovix. Like that, so you got a GT stripe in the ponds, then you're probably pretty good. Um, within two months, they're at stage 35, and by the time you're at September, you're coming out of the pond. They're not all southern coverts in there, but you can recognise the ones that are. So, what have we got? We laid in April, we flooded May, June, July, August, September. Okay, five months of continuous water supply to get them to that point. If the pond dries out for any period of time, that's recruitment over for these guys. So, dry site to start with, five months of continuous water. It, it's, it's becoming a tough ask for this species. And hopefully by late September, October, you've got some recruits coming out. So, what's happened to these guys? Well, this is the distribution of southern toadlets. Okay. 
and the most easily recognisable thing is it overlaps nicely with our agricultural and urban and peri-urban development. That coastal plain that we, we utilise so much, so pretty well a nice perfect match for southern toilets. So we've knocked out a huge extent of their, their habitat. Um, I'm still learning GIS, but I'm sure at some stage I'll get a nice overlay and I'll work out the percentages on that, maybe, but geez, you can't reckon there's more than 10% of their original habitat left for them. Um, lucky enough, in 2018, the, the Lanky Group in Illumbu um wanted to do a complete survey of all their Southern Toadlet sites. And so there's 43 records then on the Atlas. And so we systematically went through and looked at all those sites to find the toilets and see what's happening at those sites. And as you can imagine, some of the sites look like that. Some of the sites were still along drainage lines that have been just hugely modified for water flow. Um, some of the sites were still kind of natural, but been hugely modified for bike riding and hitting the footy and things like that, or people building on. And some of them were still in reserve systems. I was actually surprised how many were still in, but Nilibik's quite a, a green shire. In fact, if you look at the chart, you, between Nilibik Council, Melbourne Water and Parks, you've got 50% of those, those sites. Um, not that Nilibik Council or Melbourne will necessarily manage those sites for, for the biodiversity, not all of them, but Parks Vic certainly do. The results weren't great. Two of the 43 still had toadlets present in there. And the largest population is in a private piece of land in North Warrandyte. If anybody's got a few dollars they can spare and uh, looking for a block of land to, to purchase, I can recommend one. Um, the others are pretty scattered around Long Gully and, and Bunjil Reserve. We're talking a few individuals that may not persist too much longer. Fortunately, we did find two more populations that weren't on the Atlas that are of reasonable size, one managed by Parks Vic and one managed by Melbourne Water, which was good. Um, but this means the sites we're looking at now are pretty well this fringe rim where the coastal plain now abuts the foothills. And we've really pushed the toadlets into that little narrow band um, and certainly some around some of the reserve systems down through here. The black isn't good, the red's possibly better. So apart from a land grab, we had the foresight to introduce a few friends for the toilets as well. And it turns out that these guys have a real preference for toilet habitat. And in fact, they've got amazing capacity to turn a beautiful breeding site into something else within a season. And deer are getting into a lot of these gully systems and going from left to right in here. Um, and you can imagine that impact that that's having. We did a little um, assessment for a land manager that had a number of gullies that had toadlets in there and deer. And there was a huge variation in the quality. Now this BSI, Sounds like a bullshit index. It's actually a breeding site index, but um, perhaps it is the latter. Um, the lower the index, the better it is for southern toadlets. And there was a huge difference in the sites that the toadlets were occupying and the sites that ears were damaging. And you might say that, well, you know, some of these aren't so bad, so, so bad, but really what you're looking at is toadlets that are in this gully system don't have a choice. If you want to live in there, you've got to pick a bad site. Okay? So that kind of skews the graph a little bit. Pitchford's an interesting one. It's another thing that we're brought. Um, there's been some ad hoc Pitchford surveys for toadlets. Um, 2017, we did a whole heap of species in Gippsland, thanks to the work of Matt West. None of the toadlets ever showed any chytrid, but we did sample um, tree frogs, and a number of them showed chytrid. Uh, marsh frogs, a number of them showed chytrid. So the frogs in that landscape with them, a number of them had chytrid, but we couldn't pick it up on any of the toadlets in Gippsland. In 2020, we did 34 toadlets 
exclusively just along um, Churchill National Park, along the channel there, if you're familiar with it. Three of them tested positive, but none of them showed signs of disease. They all appeared perfectly normal. And we haven't picked any up in North Warrandyte and all the samples we've done. It, I would be surprised if chytrid's a huge impact on this species as adults. Maybe the impact might be in more larval and metamorphs. But as adults, you've got to imagine they're in a dry landscape over summer. It's not exactly a great ground for harboring chytrid. And they don't have a lot of contact with water. You know, this is a species that you know, burrows into the dry sides of depressions. Um, they're, they're not ever really in contact with water on the brain. So probably doesn't have a huge role, but who knows? And of course, climate change. And you can imagine for a frog that is specialized so much on its breeding and the, the need for five months of uh, continuous water in its depressions, how important consistent and regular water input is. And this little site here, this is in Donvale, and that was probably taken two decades ago, maybe now. Um, the base of this pond was depression, was just basically, it wasn't harboring much vegetation. If you're seeing grass grow into the base of it, then you, you know it's not really holding water for any length of time. And if you see aquatic plants growing there, you know it's holding water for too long. So what you're really looking for is a depression that's got a nice lot of leaf litter and bark and stuff like that. And, and stuff's growing on the fringes. And that used to be what Donvale looked like. This is Donvale site breeding depression now. You know, it's just grasses. If it, it's holding water, it's just not holding it for any particular length of time. And, and things are changing. The hydrology is changing. It's changing right throughout this frog's range. And, and that's got massive implications in trying to get this frog to recruit. 2020, we had recruitment in the population. Now, 2020 places rainfall up here somewhere. And you can see we've had some nice years. But it's not about the year. It's about those five months. And in 2020, we had a rainfall anomaly in April that was significant. A rainfall anomaly now in May, significant. And the next month, significant. And the next month, significant. And stringing those five months of significant anomalous rainfall is now what it's required to get these guys through. Forever. And probably an interesting study, but it doesn't happen that often now, as you can imagine. Um, Melbourne Water has been great in terms of their support for conservation of species on their properties. They've done a number of fencing projects now around total breeding sites. Just shows you the grazing pressure on the landscape. Fence has only been up two years. And it's best, and not just for deer, this is macropods and all sorts of things. But Melbourne Water has gone through now and fenced a number of their breeding sites and their properties which has been a really positive, positive impact. Um, it's a little turtle. And why have I... Oh, dropped out. Sorry guys, technical difficulties. Um, so, where we're at with the field work for toadlets, so as I showed you in that previous slide, I might just go back to it if I can. We have lost toadlet populations through much of the greater Melbourne area now. Um, Sugarloaf. Happy Valley still has a few. There's a private property I talked about in North Warrandyte that has a few. The rest are down to like Donvale site, which is down to now 10, 11 calling males in the one depression. And it's an interesting site because the site's got such a long history. That site had um, Southern Toadlets collected from it back in the 1800s. Um, when they described the species, 
they described the species from six locations and Donvale site was one of the six locations that they originally described the species from. Um, all the other sites are gone except for the one in the Grand Hills. So it's got, a, it's got an important historical component to it, but it's just marginal. Um, Peninsula still has some good populations, Devil's Bend Reservoir, which, you know, Matt down the back corner, if I can point him out, um, works down through there, and they've got a good calling number of 60 odd males down, and they're looking to do some conservation work on them. Um, the National Park down there still has reasonable calling males, but things like Lane Warren Fauna and Flora Reserve, I think last time I surveyed there was five individuals. They're, they're pretty marginal now, and we're talking about one or two depressions for these things. Um, Survey all the way down, I know there's a couple of reds there. Survey all the way down those coastal parks. Deadly silent, nothing down through there anymore. There, I know Wilson's Prom has now fallen off my map. There is, or at least was, a, a large group of southern tablets down there. That was 10 years ago. 10 years is, is a fairly long time here because if I look at um, Bunyip State Park, 10 years ago I would have said to you the largest calling collection of southern toilets is in Bunyip State Park. Go down there. You'll, you'll listen to hundreds of them calling through the forest. It's incredible. Last year I picked up three. Um, and you think, well, you know, is it the fires that are doing this damage to the frog? And the three I picked up were all in really burnt out areas. And the site at, at Bunyip, where the largest population was, wasn't touched by fires. Vegetation hasn't changed. But something has gone on through there. Um, these coastal systems down here, this is south of Holly Plains. Um, all those historical sites, can't find toadlets in them anymore. But Holly Plains, really good populations of southern toadlets in there at the moment. In fact, it's probably only one or two places in Victoria where you can pitch your tent on or next to a calling southern toadlet, if that's ever something you desire. But um, really good numbers and heavily burnt out in the last 12 months. Fire in the toilet's an interesting thing. Um, up through Ewing Morass, which is up through here, smacked by fires about 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Southern toilets were everywhere immediately after those fires and have persisted in those environments, um, however decreasing for the last 10 years. We've been monitoring every year as we go through there. All other species were gone for two years, but the toadlets persisted. And I, I have no idea how a, an animal the size of your thumbnail escapes a high intensity fire and ain't outrunning it. It has to go down, but you have to, you have to go down a long way to try to get out of that. Um, most of the stuff up East Gippsland is still in really good nick in terms of numbers. However, they had severe flooding events earlier this year through there and particularly through a number of the Southern Toadlet sites, rural sites. So it will be interesting to see what impacts that has and hopefully we'll get to do some tadpole work in the coming months up there to have a look at that. So kind of in summary, I guess, we're, we're talking about a frog where we've taken most of its habitat. We've introduced some pest animals and a disease that, well, at least the pest animal is having a massive, massive impact. Um, we have successfully changed the climate, which has made a lot of its traditional breeding sites now um, not really very functional. And in fact, as faithful as they are, they will persist to call in sites. You've just got to go, there's no way in hell this is ever going to recruit from you. But they will call there 10 years until they eventually die and move on. Um, so it's not a great news story. But there are people and organisations that are doing work for them. So again, another shout out to Melbourne Water for their fencing program. I know down at Devil Bend Reservoir, they're looking at changing the hydrology down there to enable the Southern Toilets to recruit. Parks Vic, heavily strapped for resources, but a number of Parks Vic staff go out of their way to try to manage Southern Toilets on their property uh, through survey work and, and or some careful contractor control within the park systems themselves. So there is a lot starting to build now towards Southern Toadlet conservation. And I think hopefully 
in the future that will grow because they're not a cornerstone species and you know if we lost southern toilets out of the environment what does that really mean but this is the first southern toilet i ever saw um mid 90s and i just was blown away by it this was just the most awesome looking animal i've ever seen and i was just wrapped in it and it, it inspired me it's inspired me for 30 years and I think we lose that out of the environment, we lose something, don't we? If people can't see this sort of stuff and get inspired by it, you know, what, what have we lost? So even though that I don't think anybody will miss the chorus, and I'm sure most people don't know a southern toadlet when they fall over it, there is something about the loss of this creature that I think, you know, we really need to be careful about. And uh, it will make a difference, and hopefully, people will pick up this conservation and continue to work towards it and we'll see some momentum gathering. Anyway, questions? <laughs>